Thanks, everybody. Um, I have really beautiful slides to show you, so the more you're in that area, the happier I'm going to be, and you'll probably be also. Um, thank you. I always love speaking at these things, and I'm, you know, I've known Rick Doblin since 1985, and I'm really impressed at the gatherings he's created recently. Um, so my topic this afternoon, and I may wander off the topic ever so slightly, for those of you who heard me speak before, um, I'm going to be speaking about ethics in psychedelic research. So let's start with the Nazis, shall we? The, the basis of modern research ethics began with a desire to protect human subjects involved in research projects. And the first attempt to formally craft regulations began during the doctor's trial of 1946, which was a segment of the Nuremberg trials for the Nazi war criminals. To prosecute the accused Nazi doctors for the atrocities they committed, a list of ethical guidelines for the conduct of research, the Nuremberg Code, was developed. Most clinical research guidelines for ethical behavior stem from these 10 precepts, which I'm not going to read to you because you can read while I'm talking. The highlights are voluntary consent, anticipated benefits should outweigh anticipated risks, and the risks should not be dire or life-threatening, and the subject should be allowed to quit whenever they want, and the experiments should be terminated if continuing them would bring any harm to the subjects or injury or death to the participants. This is some moss growing on a tree trunk. Um, I'm going to just sort of mix up the boring data slides with beautiful pictures that my um, husband, my partner, Jeremy Wolf, took. Um, all of the photographs in this presentation, except some of illegal drugs, were taken by Jeremy Wolf. You can see his work at already.com. Okay, so uh, the Nuremberg Code missed some pretty important stuff. Uh, fully informed consent is not really covered in the Nuremberg Code. So, you know, they talk about voluntary consent, um, but not about being fully informed of the risks and benefits of the study, or even knowing that they're in a study, which is also something that you have to do. Even if you're just gathering chart data, you, you know, you, well, maybe chart data is a different story, but people have to know they're being uh, monitored, that you're taking data from them, so you have to have an informed consent. Um, and all the risks and the benefits of the study need to be completely spelled out, and then you have to make some sort of effort to ensure that the subjects really understand what they're agreeing to. And some studies go so far as to give a quiz to make sure that the subjects really have reviewed the consent form and know what they're getting into. Um, and then also there's the issue of confidentiality, which Nuremberg Code didn't really cover. Um, research subjects need to be assured that all the identifying information about them won't be made available to anybody, um, anyone who's not directly involved in the study. And you know, now we have this issue of press coverage where uh, we get called a lot because the press, you know, they, they can't write a story without having a face. You know, they need, and they need a visual, and so they want to have video of people who are doing perhaps the psilocybin mystical study or the MDMA study. So this is sort of a, a line that many of us are walking um, because the truth is that media coverage does mean better enrollment. On the other hand, media coverage means that your institution is not going to be happy with you. Um, and you know some of the some of the subjects are perfectly happy to give interviews, and others really don't you know don't want the attention. So um, the other issue I'd like to talk about a little bit is the right to service. You know sometimes when you do research, you have a, a subjects who get the drug, and then you've got a control group who don't get the drug, and that's not always fair to the people who are in the control group. Um, certainly, when you have like say cancer research, you make sure that the control group is sort of an accepted treatment modality, but sometimes when it comes to psychedelic research, people, some people just don't get the study. So it's, I think it's nice to have a crossover design where you eventually get everybody to have both placebo and active drug. Um, the, where the right to service really comes up for me um, is how hard it is to get any of this research off the ground and federally approved and funded. That's why I put this part in bold. Um, this is fungus growing on a tree trunk. I think it's beautiful. So here's some other issues when it comes to research ethics. Um, and there are, these are all sort of related to some extent. You've got conflicts of interest. Um, you know, the pharmaceutical industry or the government, they have a tendency to fund the studies that they, you know, have some interest in the data 
coming out. Um, so only certain researchers who deliver the data they desire are going to get funded. Um, and then you've got research misconduct. Um, you know, I mean, the example many of us know about is the George Riccardi study where, um, oops, they mistakenly published data from methamphetamine saying that it was MDMA. Um, so I think it's important, you know, we all need to be vigilant and skeptical. Um, any data that comes out first, it's always smart to say, you know, we get some interesting data and, you know, we're curious to see what other people get, so we're going to wait and, you know, see who replicates the study, as opposed to having one study and saying, oh, look, one pill is like playing Russian roulette, you know, with your brain. Um, then there's researcher misconduct associated with some of the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy work that went on in the 70s and 80s where um, you had sort of inappropriate relationships between therapists and patients. Um, I don't, some of you probably haven't heard of this, but when, you know, before MDMA was illegal, when, when there was a lot of sort of underground psychotherapy going on, this sort of thing happened a little bit, and um, we don't want it to ever happen again. So transparency, um, a couple issues here. Um, there's an issue of hiding data. You know, Big Pharma has sort of been doing this for years, and luckily now more and more the media is uncovering these stories about you know, cherry picking data and what to publish and what to hide. Um, you know, GlaxoSmithKline had this diabetes pill called Avandia, um, and they recently paid a $3 billion settlement class action suit because they failed to report safety data that some people would have liked to have known ahead of time. Um, and then there's uh, evidence that Merck hid the risks associated with Vioxx, which is a painkiller. And this, this is uh, data that's still really continuing to emerge. I mean, when I was in medical school, we treated a, a gal who was completely yellow from head to toe and needed a new liver um, because she had acute liver failure from this you know, great new prescription drug. Um, so you know, millions of people are taking prescription medication daily, and they're not all benign, and it's important that we don't hide data saying that they're not all benign. I think that the medical journals have a bit of a bias um, against publishing null data. You know, if you do a study and, oh, you know, we didn't really find anything wrong, then nobody wants to publish it because it's boring, it's not sexy. Um, and, you know, this is something that, um, I'm sorry to mention George Riccardi again, but, <laughs> He sort of hides behind, you know, he has some null data where, you know, he gave single oral doses of MDMA to these monkeys, separated by a couple of weeks. They didn't really find anything interesting, and, you know, we didn't really see any neurotoxicity. Nobody really wanted to publish it. Well, it's important to publish it anyway. I mean, you know, people need to know if something is, you know, somewhat safe and you didn't see anything bad. That's also important to publish. So the other side of transparency that I want to speak about, if there are any researchers here in the room, is I think it's really important that, all, that we all cooperate as much as we possibly can. Um, if researchers can coordinate their outcome measurements, they can pool their data. And pooling the data means that you have an increased power in your experiment. And it's not always easy to get research subjects. So any time that we can have transparency and cooperation where everybody makes very clear, you know, this is the dose we're using, this is what we're measuring. If other people do it the same way, you pull your data, you have more power. So that, I think that's really important. Fewer subjects to get strong data, that helps everybody. It makes it go faster. Because uh, recruitment's tough. Um, this is a climbing vine outside of our garage. I, don't, I just like these, these pink suckers glomming onto the wood to support the stem. I don't know. It speaks to me. Uh, anyway, so um, here's what I'm, I'm going to say. I didn't know if I should write yo or bro on this side, but I decided it would exclude the women if I said bro. Although, yo bro. It's my friend from college, Venus. Um, I've been involved in clinical, clinical research um, since, actually since I was a medical student. I did clinical research on hallucinations as a medical student, and then as, um, as a resident, I, I tried to use a new drug in schizophrenia. Um, I've, I've always been really impressed with institutional review boards and medical ethics committees, and you know, people take their jobs very seriously. Their duty to protect the clinical research subjects, they do a really good job, and, and I've been sort of peripherally involved with Hefter and more integrally involved with MAPS. Um, as a medical monitor, and I've sort of been a, you know, psychedelic research cheerleader. I've been a fundraiser. I've been referred to as a fairy godmother. Um, but, the, you know, the bottom line is that I have a lot of um, contact with a lot of researchers here at, at this 
um, at the Psychedelic Science Conference. And I'm really impressed, again, with how seriously everyone is taking the issue of research ethics. You know, nobody wants to make the same mistakes that were made in the 60s or 70s that eventually led to research being shut down. And so far, none of us are making these mistakes. So it's all good. Um, I hardly ever say it's all good, by the way. I think it's, you know, usually things are somewhere between it's all good and it is what it is. So spectrum in there. So anyway, as, as you know, it's like it's not all good and it is what it is. Yeah. No, I don't say that either. Um, as much as anybody can guarantee the behavior of other people, which is not at all, um, I will tell you that these scientists and researchers working all over the world on psychedelic research that I've had the privilege of working with and being in touch with, um, and you have the privilege of hearing speak this weekend, they're, they're not going to screw up because there's too much at stake. So that's rosy news. So my, my big uh, ethical question is how can you defend no research? Um, if there were no research on psychedelics, there would be no psychiatric discoveries like serotonin, for example. One of the biggest breakthroughs in psychiatry and psychiatric research was the pioneering work done with LSD in the 50s. Over 1,000 papers, over 60,000 research subjects, and it helped form the basis of modern psychopharmacology today, which means it helped to pay my mortgage. Um, a more recent, I didn't write that in, I just moved that up. A more recent vein of research um, is the work now that's being done on ketamine. I mean, once ketamine was considered, it still is considered a club drug, but we now know that ketamine can reverse depressions in unipolar depressed and bipolar depressed patients more quickly than any standard antidepressant. And it's been shown to reverse suicidality pretty quickly. Um, in minutes. And, you know, it's very possible that MDMA-assisted psychotherapy can also acutely reverse suicidality as well, um, although we haven't specifically looked at that outcome measurement yet. So my point here is that psychedelic research has a lot to offer it in terms of expanding our knowledge base and helping people in acute crises. Um, but also, and that's what I really want to spend the mo bulk of my time talking about is it can help us out of our chronic, not so acute situations, um, like our cigarette addiction, or our general malaise, and our solitude, or our selfishness. And maybe it can help us to open up to ourselves, to others, and to all the good that we can do in the world. So if you look at the world's richest 20%, they give an average of 1.3% of their income to charity. If you look at the world's poorest 20%, they give 3.2% of their percent of their income to charity. So, and you know, the idea here is that maybe this has something to do with empathy, that poor people know how hard it is to be poor, and they're more likely to give whatever they can to help others. So there is something to be said for empathy and cultivating that emotion. And we all know what MDMA was called before it was called ecstasy, right? No, I'm not talking about Adam. That was before. I'm talking about after Adam and before ecstasy. It was called empathy. Uh, but the name ecstasy had a bit more of a hook. Good marketing. But MDMA can reliably enhance people's sense of connectedness, and possibly due to enhanced oxytocin levels and the neurotransmission of oxytocin, maybe prolactin. Um, oxytocin is a hormone of social bonding and of trust. And I don't know exactly what the pharmacological basis is of empathy, and you know, maybe it's serotonin, maybe it's oxytocin, but um, you know, this is really what the world needs more of. And if I were gonna have music on this PowerPoint, you know what I would be putting, piping in right now. So here you have 13 religions um, with one major message in common, which is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In Judaism, they say, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That is the whole Torah. All the rest is commentary. In Islam, not one of you truly believes until you wish for others what you wish for yourself. Hinduism, this is the sum of duty. Do not do to others what would cause pain if done to you. Taoism, regard your neighbor's gain as your own gain and your neighbor's loss as your own loss. And here's my favorite because it's so transpersonal and therefore a little kind of trippy, which is the Unitarianism. We affirm and promote respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. So 13 religions, which one of the reasons why I like that slide, uh, is my favorite number. Um, 
I, uh, I grew up on exit 13 in uh, Massachusetts Turnpike, and I was born on the 13th, and I love it when my birthday is on a Friday the 13th. And the past few years, I've been uh, raising money on Facebook, because I really can't stand when you get like, you know, just a ton of happy birthday, have a good day. So now what I do on my birthday on Facebook is I'm like, why don't, why don't you all give $13 to MAPS? But you could do it for Hefter or Council of Spiritual Practices or the Beckley Foundation, but you know, just get all your friends to kick in a little money to some place that is doing good work like this. But you can pick your favorite number, it doesn't have to be 13. Um, <laughs> So, this used to be the number of people that died every year from alcohol-related medical illnesses. Now, actually, these days it's down to about 80,000, but I thought 100,000 was funnier. Um, so, this makes excessive alcohol intake the third leading lifestyle-related cause of death for the nation. Cigarette smoking is number one, which is why the Hopkins work is so important. And I love that you guys are using a solid dose, because I think that's why you're getting solid data. So, I applaud your solid notes. Um, so, cigarette smoking is the leading cause of mortality in our nation, and poor diet and physical inactivity, which had always been sort of a distant second, is starting to actually overtake tobacco as number one, because fewer people are smoking, but um, obesity is still a huge issue in America. So anyway, you know, 100,000 down to 80,000 is some sort of good news, I suppose. This is an iris from our garden. So the bad news is that alcohol-related medical illness costs our country about $30 billion annually, and that's just the medical side. Um, in 2006, sorry, I should have more recent data, but there were more than 1.2 million ER visits and 2.7 million physician office visits due to excessive drinking. Um, so the 30 billion is just about the medical illness cost. It's the 235 billion is when you add up all the other costs from car accidents and domestic violence and homicides and suicides, which are more closely linked to alcohol than any other drug. So more lives are lost from alcohol than all other drugs combined. Um, this, these are some manufactured incense from Vietnam that were drying in the sun. I was just trying to find a picture like, you know, that showed, you know, multitudes. Lots of numbers, so. Anyway, here are some mind-blowing statistics about alcohol before we move on to cigarettes. 30% of all deaths from fire are attributed to alcohol. 30% of all accidental drownings are attributed to alcohol. 30% of all suicides are attributed to alcohol. 40% of all deaths due to falls. 60% of all homicides. So, you know, alcohol is a toxic drug. It's a killer drug, and it's legal. Uh, 500,000 people die every year in America from cigarette smoking related illnesses like emphysema and other pulmonary diseases and cancer. And cancer. Um, this is a plant called the mother of thousands and when you take one leaf and put it onto the dirt it grows a whole other plant and I think that's very cool and trippy. So these are the the costs for cigarettes and what you can see is that the medical cost for cigarettes is higher um, but the other, you know, the, the here, I'm going to use one of these things. Look, that number, doesn't matter how calm you are, when you look at that, it looks like you're shaking. Like, I'm, I am, I'm still, I'm like, I got surgeon's hands right now, but it's still a little shaky. That number is lower than, where's the other number? 235, all right, never mind. So, higher, lower. Um, and I will get to why that is in a minute. But basically, the issue is, you know, secondhand smoke aside, cigarettes don't necessarily hurt anybody except the smoker. Although, they cost us all a lot of money. They, you know, in terms of Medicaid, Medicare, we're all paying. So, with alcohol, that's hardly the case. It's not just the drinker who gets hurt from drinking. Um, this is a shameless plug for my second book, which is a not nonprofit project. Um, so, in case you haven't heard, so I, I ran the psychiatric emergency room at Bellevue Hospital for nine years, every Saturday night and Sunday night, minus vacations. Um, I did a, like a 16 hour overnight shift and I saw thousands of patients in acutely altered states. And uh, whether it was induced by drugs or alcohol or just sort of their own internal endogenous neurochemistry gone awry, 
Um, every single shift I worked, I would be face to face with people in acute manic episodes or schizophrenic breaks or horrible suicidal depressions. And I saw a lot of people strung out on methamphetamine or high on crack um, or drunk, very rarely stoned, very, very rarely tripping. Um, Alcohol was far and away the drug that wreaked the, the, wreaked the most havoc at Bellevue. And when, you know, when I was at Bellevue, would know, without question, the most sickness, the most violence, the most chaos, the most heartache that I saw came from alcohol abuse and dependence. So crack was a distant second, heroin an even more distant third, and not even on the radar was cannabis, mushrooms ecstasy. And so what is on my radar now and what should be on America's and on our government's radar is that using these less toxic medicines to heal ourselves from the more toxic medicines, using psilocybin to heal addiction to cigarettes or to alcohol, or using MDMA to heal PTSD, or using cannabis to heal just about everything else. <laughs> That's what I would like to talk about. More multitudes. What is this, sprout moss? This is sprout moss. It's usually green. So this is a chart sort of looking at harm to self versus harm to others, which is what I was talking about before with alcohol and cigarettes. Um, so alcohol does top the list um, for harm to others, which is in red. And you know, remember, it's not, it's not just drunk driving that is killing innocent people. I mean, it's the barroom brawls, it's the domestic violence, it's the rapes, homicides, suicides. I mean, cigarettes have a higher ratio of harm to self than harm to others. Let's see, tobacco, I don't know if you guys can see, I think tobacco's, can you see? Because I can't, I can't. <laughs> okay. So cigarettes have a higher ratio of harm to self as opposed to others, and cannabis is sort of 50-50, and I don't know exactly what harm there, uh, I wish I knew what harm they're talking about here, but um, it certainly, cannabis does not have the same association with violence and with suicides that alcohol does. Um, but then, you know, look at the very low level of harm with LSD, mushrooms, MDMA. This is the desert at night. So, and these numbers are the therapeutic ratio, just looking at all these different drugs and um, what the ratio, so a therapeutic ratio, for those of you who don't know, is, is the effective dose over the lethal dose. So, you know, you think of something like um, lithium or digoxin or chemotherapy, I mean, these are medicines that do a lot of good, but if you take too much, you die or you have horrible problems. So you look at something like cannabis where basically you can't overdose, you know, it's not going to stop you from breathing. There's no known lethal dose. So, I mean, this is actually an imaginary number. I think they just sort of randomly gave it 20,000. But um, this would be a high therapeutic ratio. And then you have heroin down here at the bottom. Um, and alcohol is pretty low down here, too. So anyway, what's interesting to me about the slide, besides just having a sense of, like, you know, what's, what's potentially therapeutic, um, what's potentially dangerous, and then what's legal, what's illegal, what's unscheduled. So the green ones are not scheduled, which means they don't, you know, even though they may meet criteria for Schedule 1, <clears throat> alcohol and cigarettes, <clears throat> they're not scheduled. And then you have things like cannabis, which are in Schedule 1, which, um, in my opinion, is complete insanity, and I'm a psychiatrist, so I know what insanity is. Um, <laughs> So, you know, what I mean, my, my delusion is that I would like to have universal drug scheduling, which is that we are honest about really, really, is it meeting criteria? Does it have a medicinal use? Is it addictive? Is it dangerous? Is it toxic? Could it be used therapeutically? And, like, let's be honest and really look at everything. Um, but I am, I am an eternal optimist. Like a flower in the desert. Um, these guys bloom every year, no matter how dry it is, they somehow get it together and become beautiful, even though there are prickly things all around it. So in America, 1,200 people every single day die from illnesses related to cigarette smoking. Worldwide, about 5 million people die every year because they're addicted to cigarettes, which, by the way, are the most addictive drug that anybody has been able to figure out so far. You guys are nodding your heads. You know this. This is called preaching to the choir. Yeah. So, you know, most addictive drug we know of, but it's not scheduled. Anyway, um, 
So more than, you know, more than heroin, more than crack, if, you know, if you look at this, uh, it's a 1999 incident, excuse me, Institute of Medicine report looking at, you know, what percentage of people, if they try a drug for the first time, what, what percent go on to become addicted to that? And the highest number that they have is for cigarettes, which is 32 percent. Um, and then you've got opiates, and this is not just heroin, this is, you know, prescription painkillers, which are a huge problem in America now because they're really addictive. Not so addictive they would be in Schedule 1, but very addictive. Um, so opiates are at 23, cocaine is at 17, alcohol is at 15, cannabis is at 9. You get the idea. So 69% of the people who smoke cigarettes want to quit but can't. And this is what I got on my MCATs. Um, and I know the scoring has changed now, but back in 1991, this was actually a good score. I really wanted to break 70. I wanted to break 70, but I thought, you know, if you have to have a double-digit number to talk about it, like 12 different interviews, this is not a bad way to go. <laughs> it was fun. Um, this is a fro. <laughs> My college friend really liked that joke. <laughs> this is a frozen lake across the street from my house. I left the, we lived in Manhattan in the grimy, dirty, fabulous city for years and years and then we moved out to the country and it's been very good for my family and for us to be in nature. So um, I emailed Matt Johnson because I wanted some stat or some number or some idea and Roland, before you panic, <laughs> he told me 75%. I was like, Matt, you know, how many people are quitting smoking from your study? I want to, you know, throw it up on a slide. And Matt, very conservatively and, you know, I, it's always good to sort of underestimate and you know you want to err on the side of being conservative it's like it's probably around 75 percent because you know at the 12 month follow-up you know we have three that were complete non-smokers but you know one guy you know went from a pack a day to smoking like a you know one or two cigarettes a week and i'm thinking like that's not 75 percent you know so i i put it at 90 plus and i and um your colleague you guys have great numbers and it's really exciting and you know I don't think that you, I mean, do you have to use abstinence as your, as your benchmark? Because somebody who goes from a, a pack a day, which is like, what, 600 a month to five a month, that's a pretty good reduction, <laughs> you know? I'm like, can't you say if you cut down 90 or 95%, we're going to consider you a success? So um, anyway, I was going to go over all your numbers, but now I don't have to because many of you were just here and heard all these amazing numbers. And, you know, I really hope that the government pays attention because your data is strong. So, um, bef I'm, I know I'm kind of beating a dead horse here. Here's just sort of the breakdown of um, millions of Americans who are using illegal drugs and alcohol and cigarettes aren't on, on this chart, but um, it's around 45 million uh, Americans for cigarettes and around 17 million have an alcohol addiction. Um, I, I don't know if these numbers are full addicts or just, you know, sometimes they just say, like, have you used this drug in the last month, which, you know, doesn't necessarily imply that you're an addict. Anyway, um, you know, you can see that some numbers are significantly lower than others. Um, and these are, these are sort of stats of people who are just starting to try illegal drugs and what, you know, what do you start out with and what do you try? and. Um, you know, this gateway theory keeps coming up, which makes me crazy, because if you, if you ask any junkie or crackhead or anyone who's, a, you know, a, a daily user of drugs, what they started with, they will tell you they started with cigarettes and with alcohol. They won't necessarily tell you they started with cannabis, but nobody talks about cigarettes being a gateway drug. They all, they all say that pot is a gateway drug. Um, and the thing that I always say, and you should say, is first of all, there really isn't any strong data supporting it's a gateway drug. Um, and, you know, in the same way that every motorcycle rider started out riding a, a bicycle, but not every bicyclist ends up on a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And um, what else do I say about Gateway? Oh, uh, I'll, I will also get to this later. But, you know, there, there are plenty of clinicians in California where they're allowed to prescribe or recommend cannabis as a medicine who are taking people who are addicted to alcohol who are addicted to prescription painkillers or other drugs and having them use medicinal cannabis and um, sort of bringing them into the fold of the medical users and, um, you know, giving them therapy and 
they get off the drugs that are more toxic and on to cannabis, which is less toxic. So in that way, you can think of it sort of as a terminus drug as opposed to a gateway, although no one knows what terminus means. Anyway, one of the other things I wanted to mention here is that you obviously there's a lot of people who are trying cannabis. There's my little thing here. But do you see, do you see how low this number is? We have to get these numbers up, people. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, sure, you know, we're beating heroin and cocaine and that's fine, but inhalants, <laughs> painkillers and inhalants, inhalants for God's sake. So you guys need to represent, because this is crazy. Anyway, all kidding aside, um, the reason that I'm showing you these numbers of drug users and addicts and talking about the toxicity of certain drugs and coming off them um, to be on less toxic drugs is that, you know, there's one principle of chemistry that I always really believed in and understood um, when you're a med student, you have to do like a year of organic and a year of inorganic, and you don't always understand everything. But this, I understood. Like dissolves like. So the idea here is that you use water to dissolve a water-soluble product, uh, you know, like a solute, and you would use something that's not water, like ether, um, or some other sort of carbon-based solvent if you're trying to dissolve a substance that isn't water-soluble. <coughs> and so it is with drugs. Sometimes the best thing to get an addict to stop using is to give him or her another more powerful drug experience so that he or she can see the light. Um, and the case in point would be psilocybin for smoking cessation, or using LSD to get an alcoholic to stop drinking, or using Ibogaine to get a junkie to stop shooting up. Um, and here was where I was going to talk about all the cannabis clinicians who are using cannabis so that people will switch over from liquor or white powders to their green medicine. So getting back to the research ethics issue, which is what I'm supposed to talk about today, remember? Um, if we have a nation of drug addicts and alcoholics who are costing us money and hurting themselves and hurting other people, then we have an ethical responsibility to use whatever works to help them and to heal them. And that means promoting research on things like Ibogaine and ayahuasca and psilocybin and cannabis to see what this sort of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy can and can't do. This is a close-up of the black ice across the street from my house that formed this winter on the lake, and we had a lovely winter ice skating. And here's another macro of black ice, and if, um, I don't know if there are any med students in, in the house or people who looked at slides in neuropathology, but this, when I was looking at the ice, I was really struck by how much, to me, <laughs> they looked like um, axons and dendritic spines and glial cells, and if somebody here will, anybody else get that, anyone? Thank you. Okay, anyway, I'm trying to switch gears here. So according to Janet Reno, around 30% of veterans come back from Iraq and Afghanistan with post-traumatic stress disorder. And lest you think that sitting in a room with a joystick is somehow less damaging than being on the ground, it turns out in a recent study that the drone pilots get PTSD just as much as the combat veterans are getting it. So this just came out February 23rd in the New York Times. So. It's not any better. They're still killing people and it's traumatizing them. Um, the Veterans Administration is, is sort of completely overwhelmed by the amount of psychiatric morbidity that they're dealing with. For the first time in history, active duty suicides now outpace battlefield fatalities. For every soldier killed on the battlefield this year, about 25 veterans are dying by their own hand back in the States. So what do we do with these psychically wounded veterans? I keep reading about how overwhelmed the VA is and how they have these long waiting lists for their vets who are suffering and how much money it's gonna cost the country. Um, psychiatric disability claims are dwarfing physical disability claims. And so it, it's not just treatment that's expensive, but it's also paying for their dysfunctionality month after month. You know, it's not just paying for their treatment. They, these guys can't make any money and so we're paying them every month just to live. Um, many veterans are not receiving care, they're not even seeking psychiatric care, which means that the numbers are actually much higher than they're saying they are. And um, I just read the results of a recent telephone survey of 1,659 active duty service members. 17% <coughs> are already in psychiatric treatment. But 40% of those interviewed admitted that they were hesitant about seeking treatment for their psychiatric complaints because they didn't want to be put on medications or they felt that the treatment wouldn't really be helpful. Um, and a much smaller percent, like 16%, didn't want to because of concerns of stigma. 
Um, an American soldier dies every day and a half on average in Iraq or Afghanistan, or they did, from combat injuries. Sorry, this is, uh, I cut and pasted this from a talk I gave a couple years ago. <coughs> We're not there anymore, so hopefully that's stopping. Um, the veterans kill themselves at a rate of one every 80 minutes. So also, you need to factor in the increased level of homicides and arson and alcohol addiction and drug addiction and prescription drug abuse and dependence that's going on in these veterans. So it's not just the suicides. I mean, there's numbers all over the place that these guys are in a lot of pain. And it's not just the guys. The highest percentage of post-traumatic stress disorder actually comes from women who served in the military and were sexually assaulted, often by their superior officers. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, women who've been raped in the military have a higher PTSD rate than men who are in combat. And 86% did not report that they'd been sexually assaulted. So again, the numbers are much higher. What we've seen in the Spain study by Jose Carlos Busso and Michael Mithoffer's work in South Carolina is that rape survivors do especially well in MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. So this is another group of veterans with PTSD who could really use our help. Twenty-two veterans commit suicide every day, and the majority are from self-inflicted gunshot wounds. So how can you ethically defend denying American soldiers their medicine? Not only could they be helped by MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, but cannabis can potentially be a lifeline in treating PTSD. There are plenty of veterans who are getting relief from their symptoms using cannabis. And MAPS and Sue Sisley in Arizona would like to formalize a study looking at whether high CBD strains of cannabis are any better at treating their symptoms than high THC strains. And I know this is going to come as a shock to you, but we're meeting with some resistance by NIDA in getting this FDA-approved study off the ground. I believe you probably heard about that this morning from Rick. If, he, if Rick talked about anything, I would hope that he spoke about that. So the anecdotal reports of high CBD strains allowing people with PTSD to relax, to sleep, to eat more normally, to be less anxious, less hypervigilant, and more connected to the people around them, they're very impressive. And, um, and Michael and Annie Mithoffer's data on MDMA-assisted psychotherapy with post-traumatic stress disorder and veterans, um, those numbers are all really very impressive. These are well-executed studies with data that dwarfs FDA-approved treatments for PTSD that are seen with SSRIs. <coughs> Michael Mithoffer has a long waiting list of veterans who would like to enter his MDMA trials, and Rick Doblin is actively courting the administration for the armed services to open up more trials, and they've actually been really receptive to his proposals. But our government has been less receptive to our using a 5,000-year-old medicinal plant, less toxic than most prescribed medicines, to help this patient population in need. If anybody wants to generate a graphic as evocative as this, using a pop plant, please email it to me before my next talk. So among research subjects with PTSD who undergo MDMA-assisted psychotherapy protocol, roughly 80% have such a massive symptom reduction that they no longer meet criteria for the illness anymore. <coughs> In medical terms, we call this cured. But nobody wants to say cured, but still. This, uh, the orange, the little orange slice of the, of the pie here, these are the 20% who don't qualify for a PTSD diagnosis anymore. So you can see the symptom severity at the beginning of the study, and then at the end, and most importantly, the symptom reduction persists for years. The mean of the long-term data right now is nearly four years out with markedly reduced symptoms. The graphic on the right shows before treatment is in dark blue. Psychotherapy alone is in light blue, <coughs> um, which is showing that 80% of the patients there still meet criteria for the diagnosis. With MDMA-assisted psychotherapy in orange, they get it down to 20. These soldiers and veterans need our compassion and our care. They do not need government-issued red tape and obstruction, preventing them from undergoing the healing transformation that is possible with psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy or the immediate relief that can be provided with cannabis. 
So far, due to the NIDA blockade, high CBD cannabis has not been forthcoming for clinical research, and that needs to change. I want all of us to pay attention to how government cooperation or government obstruction affects vulnerable patient groups. And when you talk about research ethics, this is where you need to start. Even the Army agrees. This is a quote on the front page of the Science Times, November 2012. Something really interesting that's happening in Israel, where they're doing a lot of great cannabis research and they're really looking at high CBD strains and they're generating a ton of data and it's really impressive and it's going quickly and there's only one reason why. It's because their government is behind the research happening. It's enabling, it's making it happen. And you know our government won't even look at their data. It's just, it's insanity. So what are the effects of MDMA? Empathy for others and for self, acceptance, Love, letting go of fear, connecting with others. This is what the world needs now, plain and simple. These flowers are called bleeding hearts. So the next time you hear the phrase bleeding heart liberal, I'd like you to think of me, think of this image, and you know, stand proud among many of us who are likewise. MDMA assisted psychotherapy sessions offer these veterans a safe space to explore and debrief after their trauma and arrive at some measure of acceptance about who they are and what they have been through, and possibly be met with a sense that they're not quite as alone as they thought. Speaking of feeling alone, I have an interesting stat for you. I don't know why I put it in here, except it just, it, it was interesting to me. Um, clearly our need for connecting with others is more basic than anything else. Of the seven billion people on the planet, 4.5 billion have access to working toilets. Six billion of access to cell phones. So do you remember that ad, reach out and touch someone? People really crave connection, and not just connecting with other people. I think that they crave connecting with themselves. Um, we crave connection to the planet, to the cosmos, to the universe. My theory, um, and it's an idea I'm hearing more about from others with the same thoughts, so I feel like it is sort of a growing shared belief, is that it is our disconnection from nature and from our own human natures, our disconnection from ourselves as social mammals that's causing so much of our pathology. One out of five American high school boys is diagnosed with ADHD and on stimulant medication. One of the problems with this is that it is creating a new normal these days, if you don't take Adderall during your SATs, you're at a disadvantage because everybody else is doing it. It's the new psychopharm peer pressure, um, and it's creating a new normal, but this new normal is abnormal. It is my opinion, and maybe yours too, that this much of this much pharmacological stimulation is really unnecessary. It is abnormal for young boys to sit still and not fidget and pay attention to a blackboard and a boring teacher for hours on end. Um, young boys are supposed to be out hunting wild boar for the clan. <laughs> They're not supposed to be clamped down at a desk for six hours a day. And you know, the older young boys who are coming into my office from Wall Street aren't supposed to be sitting looking at a computer for 16 hours a day. And you know, they all say they need Adderall to do their jobs. 11% of American kids are on psych meds. Use of using stimulant meds to treat ADHD has tripled in the last nine years. The number of Americans on disability for psychiatric diagnoses has gone from one, to, one in 184 to one in 76 over 20 years. That's more than doubled. But in kids, the number of kids on disability for psychiatric diagnoses has risen 35 fold in that same period of time. There are kids on combinations of medicines that have never been fully researched for use in children, and they're staying on them for lengths of time that have also never been fully researched. This is a fern just up from the ground and just starting to unfold, not yet opened. Go away, little bug, I'm talking. Um, 
you know, I obviously, and I, I, you know, again, preach in the choir, children should be medicated as a last resort. Their brains are still growing, they're still making connections, um, and then they're undergoing something called pruning. You know, when, when a kid's brain develops, there's all these connections being made, and then like late teens, early 20s, there's all this pruning happening to sort of remold and decide what connections are important and what's not. It's a very vulnerable time in brain development. Not a great time to be taking three and four different psych meds at once. Um, it shouldn't be that the first thing when you bring your kid into a doctor that they reach for their prescription pads. And I'm hearing over and over again from my patients that that is really what's happening. It's, it happens to the women patients that I treat and it happens to their kids. Um, the pharmaceutical industry has made it very easy and too common a solution to any parent's complaints of misbehavior when the first step should be to cut sugar out of the diet, add exercise, fresh air, and sunshine instead of video games on the couch with a bag of Doritos. <coughs> though I am partial to Cheetos. Um, one in five American adults now takes at least one psychiatric drug such as antidepressants or anti-anxiety medicine or antipsychotics. And these numbers aren't that much better in Europe, unfortunately. We're not only exporting blue jeans and Hollywood movies, but now we've got the rest of the world thinking they should take a pill on a daily basis to deal with their anxiety and fear and their malaise. Um, personally, I think more people should try gardening instead of using SSRIs. There's actually a bacteria in dirt that helps you to make your own serotonin. So if you are going to take my advice, you need to garden with your gloves off and make sure you get dirt under your fingernails. Um, so remember how I said one out of five? In women, it's one out of four. All across the United States, the number of women who are taking some sort of psychiatric medication is one out of four. And it's even higher in Manhattan where I practice. Um, again, paying my mortgage, but I, you know, I'd rather earn my money another way. Americans are taking antidepressants, anti-anxiety meds, sleeping pills, and now in increasing numbers, thanks to big pharma, antipsychotics, even though they're not crazy, just sad and scared. LSD, psilocybin, MDMA, and cannabis all have the potential to demolish stunted ways of thinking and being. Sweeping your problems under the rug only leaves you with a lumpy floor. Psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy takes the rug out back and beats the hell out of it. <laughs> so, how can you ethically defend not performing research into ways to get people off their daily doses? But if you think Big Pharma is going to back these studies, or the government is going to pay for that kind of research, you are not paying attention. You better take your Adderall. So the answer to how stressed out and miserable we are isn't in a prescription pill bottle. I think more than anywhere else, it's in nature. It's in connecting with nature and in the process reconnecting with ourselves. To come back into our own bodies. Like sitting in front of the computers and smartphones and texting our friends and liking their cats on Facebook is not really going to give us what we need or what our souls are longing for. Do you see these kids? Don't they look happy? These are my kids. If you want to be happy, here's some advice. Happiness is about feeding your soul. It's about reconnecting with what is real and what has been here for millennia and what is growing around us. And sometimes psychedelics help us to make these connections. They help us to re-enter our bodies and help us feel more connected to nature or to make healthier decisions for how we spend our time and what we put in our bodies. And I think this is especially true with cannabis, which I absolutely consider to be a psychedelic. Um, it's the most manageable and most available of the psychedelics, but I think if you're going to use the definition of mind manifesting, it is. Perhaps the most greatly underappreciated component of health maintenance, including mental health maintenance, is nutrition. Um, a plant-based diet is the key to fighting heart disease and cancer, the two big killers in America. But reconnecting with nature and with what's natural for us as animals includes making changes in how we eat. Processed foods are not only causing obesity and diabetes, but it's looking like they're wreaking havoc with how we create neurotransmitters in our stomachs as well. And changing to a plant-based diet is also what's best for the environment. Um, people are getting fatter. Diabetes diagnoses are going up, especially in kids. And two out of three Americans now are overweight or obese. 
Um, and there isn't any research yet into psychedelics helping with body image and weight management or nutritional status. Um, but I do, I did read when I spent three years researching pot um, that cannabis users are thinner than other Americans and that cannabis helps to balance your metabolism and that it can be used to prevent and treat diabetes. Being outside in nature is therapeutic. A study done in England where they took half the patients and gave them antidepressants and the other half and led them on nature walks had similar outcomes. And not only is being in the natural world good for your soul, but exposing yourself to sunlight is therapeutic. I tell my patients to walk in the sun and take off their sunglasses because the sunlight needs to hit your lower retinas in order to work as an antidepressant. And if you have a phototherapy lamp, they really work better if they're above you, it turns out. But they do work. Um, with no weight gain and no sexual side effects, unlike most antidepressants. But you know what else works is getting outside and doing cardio in the sunshine. And here's something else that can help your mood. Scientists at Stanford and University of Minnesota spent some time studying awe. That's A-W-E, awe. Having a sense of awe, and it's, um, the researchers found that the effects that awe has on decision making and well-being can be explained by awe's ability to actually change our subjective experience of time by slowing it down. Experiences of awe help, us to bring, help to bring us into the present moment, which in turn adjusts our perception of time and influences our decisions and makes life feel more satisfying than it otherwise would. So a sense of awe is good for you, and this should be good news to those of you who wander the planet occasionally, tripping or stoned like a dawdling toddler, mesmerized by all you see. It turns out that this particular altered state might be therapeutic in and of itself, no matter how you get there. So the other thing that's good for you and makes you happy and is therapeutic, what makes people genuinely happy and stay that way is giving, doing for other people. Mother Teresa's message was plain and simple, which was forgive others, do good, give the world your best. Um, you know, I'm supposed to talk about the ethics of psychedelic research, but obviously my message is this. It is unethical not to do psychedelic research. <laughs> <clears throat> The world needs us to find solutions to its pain and its pathology, and the answers are here, this weekend at this conference. If it's true that a great deal of psychiatric illness that is plaguing our culture today is caused by disconnection from nature, then the answer, the treatment, and the therapy is not only to provide introspection and go inside via psychedelics, but the answer is also to get outside. If you take time to examine what you find in the natural world and keep looking more and more closely, you will learn much of what you need to survive and flourish. I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna just move quickly and show you beautiful natural pictures. These are psilocybin mushrooms. So uh, not just smoking cessation, not just possibly alcoholic. I know NYU is trying to gear up to do an alcoholism study, which I'm very excited about. Um, Obsessive compulsive disorder study in University of Arizona looked like it had really promising data also. This is the vine of ayahuasca. This is the young, moist, supple, vibrant, green part of ayahuasca. It is a great gift the earth is giving us, this healing plant that engenders an altered state that appreciates nature more and helps us connect with nature and in the process allows us to heal ourselves. There was always a lot of anecdotal data on ayahuasca, healing addiction, alcoholism, and overall psychopathology, but now there's more published clinical data, and we're fortunate to have Bia Labate organizing the ayahuasca track this weekend. Um, you know, I'm just, I wanted to go on and on about cannabis, but that's another talk for another time. I like that it's a frustrated female flower. These are trichomes <laughs> that make Anyway, I really would like to do this cannabis PTSD study, so if anybody has you know, an uncle at NIDA, let me know. Um, this is an electron microscope view of trichomes, which I like because they look kind of like mushrooms. And this is another ancient medicinal plant, which is sort of wreaking havoc, unfortunately, with pain meds. And this is Ibogaine, and this is a, a vine a hops vine just beginning to get started, and this is another picture of hops. Um, one thing I would like to say about hops is that they are in the same family of, as cannabis, and it's, that's the whole family, just 
pot and hops. And I was like, don't you wish you could visit them for Thanksgiving? <laughs> So, you know, I want to talk a tiny bit about, you know, the thing about psychedelics is it lets you kind of pull back and see the big picture, see the macro. I mean, I, there's this video game I sometimes play with my kids where they're like, you know, being chased by a dinosaur and, and you have the option of sort of seeing where you are and, you know, sometimes you realize you're in a dead end. And, you know, the, the beauty of psychedelics is that they really let you pull back and see the macro. Um, and that's why I gave it. Does this canyon make my butt look big? Can't tell it's me down there. Do I, do I look fat? I was worried about putting this picture in. Here are some flowers growing in the desert. Um, you know, you can get beautiful growth anywhere, which is why we should never give up on certain patients. Anybody here who's working in a psych ER, working in a prison, working in a state hospital, working in a methadone clinic, you know the patients I'm talking about that you want to give up on. But just please remember that underneath all their defenses and their bluster is sadness and fear, always. Underneath the angry, paranoid, threatening patient is a wounded child. So this is about stopping, not being so busy, taking a moment. And this is about connecting with others and working as a team. Um, I really think that the quality of a connection that you have somebody is best uh, created when you're face to face, an eye to eye, I think physical proximity where you can breathe in somebody's pheromones and feel their aura. Um, God rest Arnold Horshack's soul. Um, so put down your phones and your laptops and your iPads and head outside into the sun, into nature, and into one another's arms, one another's arms. To that end, um, this is my partner in crime of 18 years, Jeremy Wolf, and you've been looking at his photography. Um, and he also wrote the much beloved chapter, Thoughts on Pot, in the pot book. Um, and we're playing tomorrow night at 9 o'clock, music. Um, so, these are the nonprofit books that I edited. Um, all the research, all the money funds clinical research. Um, because so far the government hasn't been that interested in ponying up the dough for these studies. So um, I want to thank you for your time. And if you, you know, there's a break after here. And if anybody wants to do q and I always love Q&A. And if anybody has any questions for Jeremy um, about Thoughts on Pot or, or anything else, um, he's available also. Thank you. Yeah.